Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming a couple minutes early. We're going to let some folks hop on and we'll give it a couple more minutes before we get started. Thanks. Got some more people coming online. Why don't we just give it another minute? Thanks for hopping on. Yeah, so what's it like for you today in San Diego? It feels very fall-like today. Um, we've had the last couple of days very, uh, well, cool for San Diego weather in the, the 60s and low 70s. But uh, I think tomorrow it's supposed to be back up to the upper 80s. So hooray, <laughs> we're enjoying the nice cool temperatures while they last. We are, about, uh, well, we're timing this well. We're just getting thunderstorms rolling in today. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, they are nice, actually. Um, oh, I, yeah, hoping, I would love that. We're hoping for frost because we've got a nasty triple E outbreak happening here, and everybody's ready for cool weather to get rid of these mosquitoes. Well, it looks like we've got some other folks that have hopped on. Hi, everybody. We ought to get started. Ready when you are. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy first day of October and welcome to webinar number five. Today we're going to talk about uh, storms and flooding and spend a little time on uh, melting ice and, and sea level rise as well. And uh, speaking of storms, we were just talking about the weather and some of you may have heard that in parts of Montana, there was a storm that came through in the last couple of days that dropped 40 inches of snow which is insane uh, for this early in the season. So just another good reminder that the effects of climate change aren't just about things being warm all the time. They can also be about just unexpected weather patterns. And again, things like 40 inches of snow in the very uh, final days of September. So uh, let's let Angie uh, take it away and talk about how storms and flooding are affected by climate change. All right. Well, hi. Welcome back again, everybody. I hope you had a productive climate week last week. I know the, our, our topic was big news throughout the country last week, so I'm feeling inspired. Hopefully you are, too. Um, so this is our fifth webinar. That means after today we will be halfway through our 10, uh, 10 webinar series. Um, after today, we will have uh, established a foundation of understanding about all five of the primary climate exposures 
and we will have talked about all the various health impacts. And so like we've already tackled temperature extremes, drought, and wildfire, um, today we're going to kind of use a familiar structure. We're going to go through two more exposures. We're going to go through storms and flooding and melting ice and sea level rise. And then that will close out this whole module where we've been focused on health impacts. And then we're going to start next time talking about how to assess the vulnerability of these health impacts at your own in your own community. So it'll be about vulnerability assessments, which will lead into a conversation about adaptation planning. So it'll be nice. We get to turn our attention towards um, towards productive action. And so today, like always, we are hoping for an interactive discussion. So we'll have some opportunity for group discussion and polls. So let's go ahead and just continue along here. Um, like we do every time, uh, I was hoping to start with a little conversation about our suggested reading. And so last time we suggested a report by the National, <laughs> I do this sometimes, that's supposed to be National Wildlife Federation. As a climate professional, I type wildfire and wildlife too often and I mix them up. <laughs> Anyway, um, so this one's called Facing the Storm, Indian Tribes Climate-Induced Weather Extremes in the Future for Indian Country. Now this report's a little older, it's from 2011, but I actually like it because it does a good job of addressing several exposures, some of which we've already talked about, drought, wildfire, today we'll talk about flooding, it focuses on snowfall events as well, um, but I like it because it does a good job of focusing on tribal specific impacts with helpful tribal examples. So I use this pretty often. And what I also like about it is it does a good job of acknowledging the resource constraints and challenges that a lot of tribes are facing and trying to figure out how to adapt and act um, on these climate impacts. And it does provide some good recommendations for some basic actions, some sort of beginning actions. So because we're talking about storms and flooding today, one of the one of the quotes in here, one of the facts that it presents is that um, there were studies done in 2003, 2009. Um, it found that more than 200 native villages were affected to some degree by flooding and erosion. And 31 villages at that time, even uh, you know, 10 years ago, were facing imminent threats that are compelling them to consider permanent relocation. So we're gonna talk more, more about that. But for tribes, the issue of storms and flooding and melting ice and sea level rise um, is affecting them probably more prominently than the other segments of the, of the country. So in the chat box, I'm hoping that you can go ahead and share some thoughts. What about this reading surprised you? Um, was any of it particularly relevant for your community? Um, you could also raise your hand, so just use that side, um, the functions on the right, and go ahead and add your question, uh, add your comments in the question box, or you can raise your hand. And Shasta, just let me know if anything is coming through. I don't see anything yet, but uh, you know, another thing you can share with us, if it's not specific to the reading, can just be about some storm issues that you may be facing in your community, maybe how things have, have changed as far as storm impacts. And if we have anybody from the Montana region who experienced that recent snowfall, maybe tell us about that. Or even questions about how you think uh, your community needs to adapt to changes in our, our storm scenarios. Maybe everybody's working on their coffee still, which is okay. Be yeah. thinking about it, because we would like to hear um, your experiences as we talk, and there'll be more opportunities to share. So whenever you have a thought, go ahead and throw it in the question uh, box there. So we'll go ahead and, and dive right in. So we said, um, you know, we've been through these other exposures. These are the topics we're going to cover today, and we're going to do our typical structure, which is um, what are the exposures? What are the secondary exposures? What are the impacts? We'll talk through some sample strategies and some tribal case studies. And for those that have experiences, we'd love for you to, um, to share those with us. So be thinking about if you'd like to share. And we do have a, a comment here from uh, Norma Linda Sydney, and she says, my community is established in the floodplain area. Last year, we had a significant flood change in how we deal with desert monsoons. Mm. And Norma Linda, can you tell us where you are? 
and we'll wait to see. But I'm thinking when I hear desert monsoons, I'm thinking, ah, she says Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay. I was going to say, I'm thinking the desert Southwest. So, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And the, I think the monsoon patterns have changed. Uh, when I lived in Albuquerque, I remember thinking, what monsoons, what the heck are these? And it seems like they're not happening in the same pattern that they used to. Um, and she also says that uh, you had a, a hundred year flood. There was a hundred year flood last year in Scottsdale and it closed down the casino for months. So there wow. you go, that's an extremely significant economic impact on your community. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yes, we hear, we're hear hearing more and more about the monsoons uh, and we're gonna hear some more examples of various tribes throughout the country experiencing flood issues and storm issues and they look, um, it's interesting because everybody's dealing with it but they look differently in different parts of the country. So let's let's start talking through it. Um, so some key climate exposure facts. Uh, severe storms, you know, there's a relationship here with what we talked about last time, which we talked about drought. While, like we said last time, overall precipitations in many parts of the country are decreasing um, with climate change. Maybe they are experiencing more drought, so less often events of precipitation. When they do occur, oftentimes they're heavier. So we're seeing severe storms, and that might include increased snowfall, so extreme rainfall or snowfall events. Uh, it may also include an upward trend in tropical cyclone activity. Cyclones would include things like hurricanes, which we're seeing most prominently in the North Atlantic, and you can see a, uh, a chart up on the upper right here showing um, changes, hurricane-induced flood effects in the eastern and central United States, um, increases um, in flooding associated with that. We're also seeing more variable thunderstorm events. So that would include wind, hail, and tornadoes. And we say variable because um, all of this is so complex. We, there's a relationship here with heat. We also, you know, earlier we talked about temperature extremes. So as oceans are warming um, and snow melt is increasing or happening earlier in the season, all of these things have a complex relationship with each other to, um, to present themselves in different ways with storms and flooding. And so it's, um, we might see more extreme events, but less of them in some cases. And that's maybe what we're seeing with tornadoes, a shorter window where tornadoes are occurring, but when they do occur, they may be happening you know, in that window more frequently. So some, a lot of this is coming from the Climate Science Special Report again. There's a link that we're gonna provide to you to that. You can look at it and more specifically look at the storms that are re relevant for your community. Um, and so obviously there's a relationship between storms and flooding. So they, these storms will often trigger flash floods, prolonged flooding along rivers and streams and coastal flooding. And so those are different kinds of floods and you may not experience any of them. You might experience all of them or just one of them. Um, these floods are also then exacerbated by sea level rise, which is a topic we'll talk about next. And um, as well as earlier snowmelt and man-made changes to the landscape. And we have a video we're gonna show next that gives a good example of how the relationship with climate change is sort of exacerbating of, um, changes that tribes are experiencing, has, have been experiencing maybe historically over the last several decades due to man-made changes on their lands. And um, so we also know that you know these storms and floods, they contribute to landslides, mudslides, and erosion. Tribes have a lot of issues with these on their um, on their lands. I'm dealing. I'm working with a community right now that's got a whole erosion study just devoted to trying to figure out what to do with their erosion problems on their lands because they have steep slopes and sandy soils. Um, and so, you know, the chart there on the right is showing um, extreme one-day precipitation events in the contiguous 48 states um, from 1910 to 2015, and you just see in general, nationwide, an increase in one-day pre heavy precipitation events. Um, number of 100-year flood events, like we just heard from Norma Linda in the contiguous United States, is projected to steadily rise for the remainder of the century. And um, interestingly, approximately twice as many flood events are expected to occur um, between the scenarios of, so I don't know if you remember, but RC P8.5. So there's two different scenarios that are often in the climate models. One is for a higher level of emissions, one is for a lower level of emissions. So basically what the literature is telling us is that in a higher in a higher regimen of emissions, a higher emission regime, we can see um, 
much more flooding. So there's some uncertainty here about how bad the flooding will be and for whom. Um, and so a higher emission regime would, would could potentially be much more devastating. So like I said, everybody on this call throughout the country has um, is experiencing some kind of flood and severe storm activity, but they may vary. And so for example, the Midwest and Northern United States, including Alaska, Alaska is predicted to receive more precipitation in the winter and spring. Um, and uh, while others may be um, not quite as extreme. This chart that I just uh, switched over to is a projection, again, provided by the EPA, which is just showing the number of 100-year floods increasing. And again, it's showing the difference between the higher emissions on top, higher emission scenario, lower emission scenario. So you're just seeing you need, um, a big difference. And what that means to me is I hope we go with the lower emission scenario. So our mitigation plans, I hope, are working. Um, I do want to show a video here. So this is a video, pretty recent, of some uh, really focus on the middle of the country, flooding events that have occurred and a focus on how it's affecting tribal communities. So we'll just take a couple minutes to, to watch. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. While the Southern Hemisphere faces its worst tropical cyclone on record, states across the Midwestern United States are continuing to recover from unprecedented flooding this week that devastated communities in Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, and particularly Nebraska. Warming temperatures, snow melt, and heavy rainfall led to a flash flood that overwhelmed the Missouri River. The rising waters breached levees, killing at least four people, destroying or damaging thousands of homes. Much of the news about the flooding has focused its impact on farmers, but the climate change fueled weather has also hit Native American communities hard with four tribal nations in Nebraska declaring a state of emergency. This is Larry Wright Jr., chair of the Punka tribe of Nebraska speaking last week. Today, I've declared a state of emergency for the Ponca tribe of Nebraska in, in our territory as it relates to our, our homeland in Niobrara, as well as our communities in North Fork and Sioux City. And we'll continue to monitor the situation as we move forward uh, in, in with the flooding. Scientists warn that more flooding is on the way as a climate change fueled extreme weather patterns around the planet. Santi Su checked this resistance created the movement skip ahead. of rock proclaiming water is life. Let's skip ahead to this. I want you guys to see from, uh, this is a Native American scholar. He's a professor and an author as well. And he's putting this into context of climate change affecting an area that was already challenging due to man-made changes over the last several decades. Estes is assistant professor of American studies at University of New Mexico, co-founder of the indigenous resistance group, The Red Nation. He is a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux tribe. Professor Estes, welcome to Democracy Now! Um, can you respond to what's happened um, in the Midwest from Nebraska on and particularly talk about the effects on Native Americans? Right, so this, this history of flooding actually goes back to um, the 1930s when the Missouri River um, flooded and flooded a lot of towns um, downriver and the United States government under the auspices of the new uh, the, the Green Deal or the excuse me the New Deal um, proposed a series of earthen rolled dams on the main stem of the river to prevent um, flooding downriver in places um, like Kansas uh, um, that are experiencing flooding right now. And so in places like uh, Lower Brule, where I'm from, um, they built the Big Bend Dam and then upriver from there, they built the Oahe Dam to um, have sort of flood control for downriver states. And so what we're seeing right now is just a continuation of the mismanagement of that river um, and the flooding that's, that, that's being caused um, specifically by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, these dams um, dislocated and forcefully removed about a third of our um, Reservation populations, including my own community, uh, in places like Fort uh, Berthold, about 80% of the tribal population um, was removed. And so, there, what we're experiencing right now is a continuation of the legacy of the Pick Sloan um, dams that were were built to prevent this kind of disaster. And so, in many ways, um, you know, we, we have a compounding of issues. Uh, with the the uh, unusual weather cycles, um, the torrential rain, um, and then couple that with the fact that 
government shut down for 35 days, preventing um, a lot of tribal communities that are now affected by this flood from getting heating assistance during the winter time. And so it's a it's a uh, it's, it's a combination of things that are that are uh, um, work here. And you know, at the end of the day, we have to remember. Um, that this, while it is related to climate change in the present, it's also related to the altering of the environment and specifically the annihilation of the river ecosystem um, to uh, provide sort of flood control in the first place. Okay, so I just wanted to share that because I think it's important to put flooding and storms in context of the other issues the tribes know to be true, know to be affecting um, the protection of their lands and the protection of their people. So. I imagine some of you can relate to some of this. And so I actually would like to hear from some of you too. Um, in the question box, if you could go ahead and be adding you know, your experiences and if you'd like to try to um, think through what kind of health impacts may be coming from the storms and flooding uh, that we're seeing increases in, in all communities across the country, please add those here. Uh, go ahead and add those to the question box. And at the same time, I'm gonna go ahead and just launch a quick poll because I wanna hear more from uh, more of your experiences. Uh, so just give me one second here. And while you're doing that, we already have a comment uh, and a, a story from Paige Hinks. And she says, hi. Hi, Paige. <laughs> uh, I'm from the Santee Sioux Tribe in Northeast Nebraska. We experienced severe flooding in March of this year, wiping out tribal members' homes without water for a week. And we are still dealing with the effects. Mold is a big issue throughout our tribal housing. It's not just the effects of the initial flood, but the after effects that hurt our community members. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry about that experience that, that you're having and, and hope that the recovery is, is going well. And you brought up one of the main health impacts of that, which is uh, lack of water. Uh, and which is strange in a flood, you think lack of water is not the problem, <laughs> but lack of clean drinking water is certainly a problem. And then, of course, what happens when things start to dry out? You get mold you get mildew, you get fungus and those effects. So thank you for sharing that. Now on to quick poll here. Um, all right, Shasta, let me know if you see it. I do. Okay, um, so we're asking what kind of severe storm events your community um, has experienced um, already or is currently experiencing. And so your options are extreme rainfall events and monsoons, extreme snowfall events, hurricanes and tropical storms, tornadoes, or you can choose that we do not have severe storms. So let's just give a minute for your folks on the line to go ahead and submit their responses and then we'll share it. This should be interesting. And if you have other thoughts, you can go ahead and add those to the question box as well if you'd like to share your experience or anticipate any health impacts. Well, and as, uh, as you see, you have to pick just one of these, but I wonder if some of you are thinking, well, which one do I pick? Because you might have more than one. So uh, pick one now that you think is the most uh, impactful. And then if you have other events, go ahead and throw those into the question box and say, we have monsoons, but we also have to worry about you know, tornadoes or, so or snowfall. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and give it another 10 seconds and we'll close it and then we'll launch the results and then we'll uh, move on into the health impacts uh, because there's plenty of them. All right, ready to close. Okay, let's see. Okay, you can see the results, right Shasta? Yes. All right, 72% um, say extreme rainfall events or monsoons. Um, not very many people, 6% extreme snowfall. Nobody's hit dealing with hurricanes and tropical storms on the line. That's interesting. 11% are dealing with tornadoes and 11% do not have severe storms. I'm curious about those 11% where you live. Um, go ahead and shoot us a comment in the question box if you have not experienced severe storms and let us know where you live. Okay. And we have a comment from uh, Karen Cosetto. She says, we have both extreme rainfall and snowfall. And uh, I know where Karen is. She's in Boulder, Colorado. So certainly you're experiencing both of those. And, and then if you just go a little bit east of Denver, you're going to be experiencing some of those tornado areas. I remember the first time I was in the Denver airport and saw those signs that said on the bathrooms that said tornado shelter. And I thought, where am I? <laughs> that was completely new for me. Right. 
Okay, well, thanks everybody for participating. Let's, uh, we're gonna go ahead and talk through um, health impacts. So, oh, and actually, we have, before you continue, we have a few more. Um, okay. So, it's, speaking of health impacts, Aaron Jones uh, notes that gastrointestinal illnesses are a health impact related to storms. So, we'll be talking about that. Uh, and then Lisa Montgomery shares that Kansas and Nebraska tribes are still experiencing flood issues. There are still numerous road and bridge closings as well as flood waters that have remained. Knowing more heavy rainfall events will occur, I worry about the soil saturation, erosion, and farms that are still underwater. It will be difficult to manage more water when the first flood has not fully receded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I can't imagine. Thank you, Lisa. Right. And, uh, those are certainly effects that you're gonna have to, to plan for. Um, and I, I wanna note very quickly that you know, somebody mentioned, um, or the the, uh, the Scottsdale flood, that was a 100 year flood. And probably all of us on the line know this, but just in case you don't, a 100 year flood does not mean that it only happens every 100 years. It means that there is a one in 100 chance of it occurring in any given year. I don't know why they don't call them 1% floods instead of yeah. well, you know, 100 year floods, because that would make more sense. But, you know, even 100 year floods, 1000 year floods, 10,000 year floods, Supposedly, the chances of those in any given year are low, but what we're finding is that the chances seem to be increasing every year. So they're not really 1% floods anymore. So one of the obvious impacts, and hopefully your community hasn't experienced it, but in a, the case of a severe storm flood, uh, we do see um, injuries and death, including drowning if folks get trapped, um, oftentimes in vehicles, sometimes in homes. Um, floods are one of the deadliest weather-related hazards in the U.S., second only to heat. Um, you may not know that. This diagram on the right, uh, it's a map, it's showing by county um, the number of people within flood hazard areas, and so those are FEMA-designated flood hazard areas. Not every tribe has a FEMA designation for their flood hazard areas, but this is generally a map of the country, and so you can see the darker blue areas have more people that are at risk of flood areas, and so some of this may have to do with population, some may have to do with actual um, exposure and um, hazards, but take a look at where you're at. You can actually go look at this. This is CDC's National Environmental Public Health Tracking Network. This is for 2011. That's the most recent they have. Um, in the U.S., inland flooding caused over 4,500 deaths between 1959 and 2005, um, and those, uh, the EPA is projecting increases, just uh, aligning with the increases in storm and flooding activity. Uh, we've talked uh, under every exposure, we talk about mental health impacts, including post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and grief. I shared this on the right um, from the American uh, Psychological Association the last time, just what happens in a disaster or traumatic event. Um, when in, with floods, the literature talks about mental health impacts that are associated with direct and longer term losses, social impacts, stress, and economic hardship. And um, for tribes in particular, economic hardship, um, it can be overwhelming if, for example, your economic drivers have been affected, if you're relying upon maybe a fishing industry or something. Um, or if your casino has shut down for long periods of time or other economic driver has shut down, or um, if the impacts are so great that the recovery is so costly and maybe some tribes actually don't have, aren't eligible right now for um, assistance from FEMA or not part of the National Flood Insurance Program. So possible, other possible health impacts, um, most of these exposures cause some kind of damage or potential disruption to infrastructure that limits access to health services or emergency services. So those can result in illness as well or carbon monoxide poisoning. Because again, in storms, we oftentimes see power outages um, uh, as a result of those storms. We see road closures because there may be flooding of poor road conditions, um, poor drainage, you know, culverts that need to be repaired. Um, hospitals can be damaged, emergency facilities can be damaged. On the right there is just, it's actually just coming from a publication that's talking about the ripple effect of how hurricanes and other disasters affect hospital care. And so it just talks about how overwhelmed uh, in storm events some hospitals can be for days or even weeks. And um, it talks about the wave of medical needs. It's not just the immediate injuries, but it might be folks that because the, 
town is flooded, they can no longer access their pharmacy and they can't get their medication or they, their power is out and so their equipment no longer works. So they end up at the hospital and hospitals may or may not be prepared for the, um, for the what's called a capacity surge. Um, and so again, I think I mentioned last time, if you are a community in touch with a local hospital, you may wanna be talking with them about their plans for capacity surges in disasters. Right. Um, let's talk about some secondary exposures. So we've already heard from some of you, you've, you've already guessed it. Um, we talked about indoor mold, that's an air quality issue, oftentimes indoors in the aftermath of a flood. Uh, mosquitoes are an issue after storms, especially when stagnant water remains after storms. Um, water contamination and supply disruption. On the right is a diagram that's I think used pretty often and folks maybe, tribal folks, may be familiar with the cycles associated with runoff and erosion associated with storms. So um, heavy storms may produce additional runoff that may not be able to be um, captured by uh, the natural systems and may lead to additional runoff that goes into various waterways, potentially your river or your estuary. Those could contaminate leading to not just um, natural sources of potential contamination, nitrates and organic material, but also toxins that may be from a local highway, um, such as a community I'm working with now. Their big, one of their biggest issues is just runoff coming off the freeway that was um, plowed, basically developed right through their reservation. Um, so, and so uh, that can lead, yes. Sorry, we had a couple of comments pop up. So, um, and this relates to the, the food contamination and supply disruption. Um, Karen shares that uh, we were at a training in South Dakota and they were experiencing flooding and tribes discussed impacts on agricultural crops and not being able to drive equipment onto fields to harvest cro crops and the stress that that was causing. And I, that's, I'm sure, an, an unimaginable source of stress when your food supply is disrupted and you're, uh, if you're selling those crops, that's your economic system being disrupted. Uh, and then as it relates to hospitals, Aaron Jones says that hospital access is a concern of mine as the Seattle area has a considerable increase in population. So I'm eyeing the 2020 census to see the number of hospitals per 100,000 people and how that may affect my membership's access to hospital care during extreme weather events. And that's great. That's a great use of the, the census data to try to figure out what the impacts may be because of an increased population on those resources. There's, yeah, and for those, that's a great, I'm glad you know about that metric. That metric is used pretty often. We use it too to look at population sensitivity. And we'll talk more about that when we get into vulnerability assessments. But um, for folks that want to, there's a Robert Wood, John, there's something called county rankings. And you can go and look at that metric, uh, hospitals per 100,000 people on county rankings um, online. Um, so there's what, uh, so we'll talk more. We're going to talk about water contamination and supply disruption. So both disruption of what, drinking water for various reasons and contamination of that water. And then as water systems are contaminated, the food systems that may come from those water systems, say fish, um, may become contaminated as well. Um, and also, you know, the agriculture. So let's, let's dive further in. Um, there isn't a lot of data associated with mold exposure events, but what I have here, um, I'm showing just the change in magnitude of river flooding in the United States. So you can kind of see up or down, these arrows up or down, if you have an increase or decrease happening in river flooding in your area, which may be a good indicator to see how much exposure you, you will have to, um, to flooding that may produce mold. And just a photo here, but the communities I work with, what we hear is that Flooding is a big issue. It may actually affect um, not just homes, but buildings and schools. So I've had conversations with communities where their schools um, have had to have very expensive remediation as a result of mold um, exposure because mold um, can affect respiratory systems and can cause a variety of different illnesses. Um, so infections and illness associated with contaminated water. So like we said, nitrates, organic toxins, um, can cause a variety of illnesses, including gastrointestinal um, illnesses. And we see gastrointestinal illnesses or um, or you, you can find data about that. Um, the CDC's National Environmental Public Health Tracking Network, um, I think, can provide some data on that. But 
it's at a more county level. It's hard to find out for me. It's hard to find out exactly how many gastrointestinal illnesses have been have occurred um, within a reservation. But if your local tribal epidemiology center is tracking that information, that could be useful. You can also look at things like drinking um, can, drinking water contaminants, uh, violations, anything that's above standard. If you are doing your own monitoring, you're going to want to be monitoring. Um, for the kinds of pathogens that may cause gastrointestinal illnesses, especially during flood events. So I know a lot of tribes that are doing that kind of monitoring regularly and during a storm event, they do additional monitoring and then they can send alerts out if there's some kind of a drinking water issue. Um, this, is a, uh, this is the um, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And so not only are they dealing, you know, potential of contamination, but because the flooding was so bad, Residents were left stranded for nearly two weeks with limited food and water. So um, if roads are disrupted um, and people cannot get in and out, then supplies may not be able to get in and out either. Uh, possible health impacts include also vector-borne disease. So we've talked about this quite a bit. Um, I thought I would share, in this case, we're talking about mosquitoes. I, we've talked about the increases in projections for West Nile across the country. Um, West Nile virus transmission cycle is just, I want you to know a little bit more about why mosquitoes, um, why we see more vector-borne diseases. And so um, there's a relationship between uh, some local animals, such as birds, to mosquitoes and back, uh, it's sort of the cycle back and forth. So the their mosquitoes are oftentimes hosted by birds, birds that have contamination. Sometimes those are being tested as well. Um, and sometimes they also pass it on to animals like horses. And so there's this ecosystem where if there's stagnation, these um, animals sometimes congregate in closer quarters and share diseases more uh, effectively um, and then can share it uh, with um, human hosts. Um, and for, we're not always susceptible to every disease that an animal might be, but for West Nile, um, Zika, and the fun triple E that we're dealing with here on the East Coast right now, those are all human um, human diseases. So um, storms and flooding, there are particular vulnerable populations. <clears throat> Some of this may be fairly obvious to you, but children and elders are particularly vulnerable, possibly because they have a, um, you know, maybe more restricted from um, escaping in a relatively fast manner. Residents living in older homes, if they're not well constructed, maybe more at risk for flooding. Neighborhoods lacking green space because more green space rather than impervious surfaces can um, uh, can result in less runoff, less flooding, less flash flooding because there's more absorption. People with physical disabilities, people without health insurance, people susceptible to health impacts of poor air quality, in this case, if they're more susceptible to mold exposure, people with mental, behavioral, and cognitive disorders, people with uh, that are electricity dependent for their medical supplies, outdoor workers, transit dependent populations, and households in poverty. So those are the kinds of populations we would recommend looking, more, you know, looking closer at to protect. And then there are certain factors that modify how severely the impact may affect your community. So somebody already said they're in the flood zone. So you would want to know how, where on your lands people and critical structures are in a flood area, and oftentimes those are designated by 100 and 500 year flood zone areas. Um, you'd wanna know more about your hydrological conditions. So if you happen to have a certain soil type that may be more conducive to flooding, you would wanna know that. Uh, uh, population, oh, so we talked about that within the floodplain. Somebody mentioned hospitals per 100,000. That's a factor for whether or not you can expect services to be overwhelmed. And then generally economic hardship or social vulnerability index if you are high on those, then their ability to recover may be more difficult. And I put community cohesion here because there's a big role for social capital and community networks to assist each other in the event of a storm and flood um, because emergency personnel or services may not always be able to get in in time. And so helping each other may be um, your best bet. Okay. So, um, we talked a little bit about possible social, economic, and cultural health impacts. So displacement's a big one here. We oftentimes think of flooding as a temporary issue, in which case we might see temporary evacuations a couple of weeks. But 
the communities we're hearing from even today are saying that their um, their flooding is lasting um, a very long time, which may lead to longer um, longer evacuations, and that can be a big social and economic hit. Um, for communities on I know communities on the north uh, Pacific Northwest um, have and are experiencing some damage to their fishing industries as a result of contamination of their water um, and inundation. Uh, saltwater and inundation. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next section. So if there are any comments here about the cultural, you know, what, how might cultural well-being and traditional ways of life be disrupted by wildfire, we'd love, we would love to hear that. We know that storms and floods can affect cultural sites, can affect cultural events, can, um, you know, if you have a fishing culture and a storm wipes out um, or contaminates the waterways, maybe you can no longer conduct your traditional activities. So give us some thoughts. And actually, even though the question says disrupted by wildfire, we're talking about storms and flooding. <laughs> so feel free if you want to talk about wildfire too. But uh, definitely uh, the, the storms and flooding uh, issue is, is what we're focusing on here. And yeah. just hearing from some of our, our folks in uh, those flood areas that are still recovering, I can imagine that perhaps there are some ceremonies or some gatherings that might have been disrupted by those and, and you couldn't hold them because perhaps things were underwater or too muddy or inaccessible um, or, or any other reason. So as you share those, I will I will break in and, uh, and add them to the discussion. And here's one from Aaron. Uh, he says, because of a heavy precipitation event on September 8th, it created a localized flood at our language department building, which caused us to close it down. So language classes were canceled that day as well. And that's a big disappointment. And language, of course, is endangered in a lot of ways. So you don't want to be having to take the focus off of revitalizing and, and supporting your indigenous languages. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that that happened. Thank you. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time here on natural and built environment impacts, although these are substantial and um, there could be a whole training just on this, but uh, we see loss of vegetation, erosion, runoff, and fish mortality as a result of storms and flooding, um, temporary and sometimes permanent conversions in ecosystems. Um, built environment impacts, the uh, chart there on the right is um, it's pretty popular. You may have seen it before. It's talking about estimated deaths and billion dollar losses for extreme events. And a lot of those extreme events have to do with storms. So you've got tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, windstorms, lightning, cold waves, and winter storms. Um, and so those are some of the most expensive and most fatal uh, um, disasters. And so you can see hurricanes being the most expensive billion dollar losses um, that we experience in the country. Let's talk a little bit about strategies. So like I said, in the next few webinars, we're gonna start diving into adaptation planning. So how do you mitigate some of these dangers? How do you reduce some of them? Uh, so one way is to develop policies that um, and plans to preserve wetlands and establish vegetative buffers along rivers and streams to reduce flooding, runoff and erosion. So sort of having nature help you. Restrict development in high risk or post disaster areas to reduce losses. So this would, um, this, you know, some of these could be potentially um, somewhat expensive. Um, develop preventative initiatives before the disaster to build human resilience skills. Um, we're going to talk more about that when we get to strategies. Um, we'll talk more about psychosocial resilience and how you can build more cohesion in your community so you can help each other um, when, you're, when you're ready to help each other. Uh, connect community members to financial resources for disaster insurance. Um, on the right there, you also see just a picture of a fire station microgrid. This is part of a presentation that we will actually have later on, um, maybe webinar eight or nine, I think, where we're going to talk a little bit more about energy resilience. But one way to go is if you're having power supply issues is to build um, alternate power sources and potentially those that incorporate renewables and battery backup and storage um, in the form of a microgrid. Uh, you can also seek assistance, resources, grants, and loans from federal agencies for disaster planning, emergency management, and um, distressed communities. FEMA is one that everybody knows. You have to be eligible to apply for those funds, and not every community is, but, but can be. 
So this is just an example, but I actually would love for a person on the line to share their own example of a case study, um, their experience with flooding, and potentially if you've done anything, a strategy that has helped mitigate some of the dangers associated with storms and flooding. But this is a tribe, this is the Hopi tribe in Arizona. Um, so they had experienced years of severe drought conditions prior to 2010, and then they had a heavy rainfall event, which also led to rock slides. They had um, $930,000 in costs to repair roads, telephone lines, water and sewer systems, and they also had some cultural damage with grave sites being damaged. Um, and so that's just one example of many that have already been shared today of how tribes are being affected. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand or let us know if you'd be interested in sharing um, your own story. And uh, give us, a, if you have any solutions, let us know. And of course, we already heard a few stories from uh, from our folks in you know Arizona in the Midwest in the Plains South Dakota uh, with their flooding events. So if any of you want to actually use your voice and and talk to us, we can certainly unmute you and let you talk about some of your experiences with flooding or even with some of the measures you've taken perhaps to plan for future floods or what you're doing now to still recover from flooding events that are impacting your communities. Well, well you know what? Everybody, everybody's become shy. <laughs> There's a big um, overlap with our next topic. So if you have a thought, it may apply here too. Um, we're gonna talk about melting ice and sea level rise. And so we're gonna do this in a quicker way because um, well, not all of you are experiencing um, these impacts. Uh, and we've already gone over so many of them. This is starting to become maybe a little repetitive. But um, let's talk specifically about what's what's kind of going on here with, um, with this exposure, these exposures. So rising temperatures um, across the globe are reducing global ice volumes and sea um, and surface extent. And so sea level rise is caused by many factors, including an increase in the water of, um, in the volume of water in the ocean, in the mass of water in the ocean due to ice melt and an increase in the volume of water due to what's called thermal expansion. So it's heating up and growing basically, and you're getting more sea ice melt, which is increasing the mass of water. And so both of those things combine to increase the, um, the sea levels around the um, around the globe. And so global mean sea level, that's sort of the metric that we use, has risen about seven to eight inches since 1900, with about three of those inches happening since 1993. And that's coming from the Climate Science Special Report in 2017. And so, you know, that chart there is just showing the pretty dramatic increase in projections for sea level rise um, over the next century. Um, and there are secondary exposures. Um, associated with these, but a lot of them are shared with storms and flooding, which we've gone over. Um, so I want to just mainly focus on the health, um, sort of the unique health impacts. And so for those of you from Alaska, this is definitely pertinent for you. And for those of you on the coast, this is going to be um, very relevant. Um, so in addition to the storms and flooding health impacts, um, we also see some unique impacts. So melting, thinning, and thawing of ice related um, of ice can cause injuries. And so actually one of the climate ready tribes, um, that's one of the awardees of the climate ready tribes program is doing a really interesting project because they are experiencing safety issues for their hunters and their fishers when they go out on the thawing permafrost and ice. They're actually um, in some cases getting injured. And so they've given them, this project was to give them devices so that they can be geolocated out there um, in the, while they're doing their hunting and fishing. Interesting. Um, and then, you know, as those practices are getting um, disrupted, uh, the safe hunting, fishing, or herding practices, then uh, these communities may be experiencing lack of nutritional abundance. And oftentimes the community is getting affected. This is their main source of sustenance. And so they are not um, as able to access other food sources or supplies, maybe from the global markets. They're they're self-reliant. Um, I would say, you know, we, we've talked about mental health impacts, including post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and grief. Um, this is going to be doubly true when and if um, a community 
has to find has to find a way to relocate completely. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about a couple of communities that um, are facing potential permanent relocation. Uh, and the other one that is sort of interesting is as ice ice is melting and maybe unearthing prehistoric disease. Which so is really sort of fascinating when you when you think about it, but also terrifying if you think about it. Uh, but we did have one comment come in uh, that that went back to to flooding uh, from Norma Linda. And she says, last year, flood causes so much roof damage in senior homes. It made me aware of how vulnerable the elder population is in case of emergency. Yeah, our elders um, there are, are just one of our vulnerable populations that are extra impacted and extra at risk under these scenarios. Uh, so, you know, the big thing to emphasize here with social, economic, and cultural health impacts is that there are communities that might might actually have to um, abandon their lands completely. And so let's just go ahead and talk about a, a couple um, of those in just a couple of slides. Um, the additional natural environment and built environment impacts may include things like habitat fragmentation. So where you're seeing uh, ice melt or fracturing of ice, you might actually have fragmentation where habitats no longer are contiguous. And so wildlife um, are not, there's not connectivity for wildlife. And you also see saltwater intrusion into wetlands and um, very various coastal areas that um, can damage habitats and wildlife as well. The built environment, um, I mean, I think these may be fairly obvious, but damages to home and business and public services, infrastructure and agricultural operations, just as a lot of time what we're dealing with here is saltwater inundation, um, or if you're in Alaska, permafrost permafrost thaw, which is actually changing landscapes. So some sample strategies. Um, these one, this is actually a picture I took when I took a recent trip to San Diego because I like to look down onto landscapes from an aerial perspective now and just see, look at all the assets at risk, uh, potential sea level rise. Um, and you get a real good scale and perspective from 10,000 feet up. Um, but it also gives you an idea of how potentially expensive it could be to manage sea level rise. And so one way is to update your hazard mitigation plan to include melting ice and sea level rise projections. So ensuring that you see it coming and you can make whatever big, you know, if there are big investments to make and relocating things, you can. Uh, relocating critical facilities and roads that may have experienced repeated exposure to melting ice and sea level rise. Develop plans for phase relocation. This is a sad. This is a sad one, um, if necessary, including op opportunities to retain community and cultural cohesion. Um, building flood and saltwater water intrusion barriers to protect assets. So that could be fortifying your seawalls, diking, or aquifer recharge. Implement advanced surveillance systems equipment for locational ice change hazards. So like we said, those devices um, that are being used in the Alaska area by some tribes for their hunters. And then another one is to establish a regional network of environmental observers. And there actually is an example of this um, that was established in the Alaska area. Uh, it's called a LEO network where environmental observers can actually go on and log their uh, observations of environmental changes themselves. So here's a couple of case studies. So um, we are seeing some of the impacts of sea level rise and melting ice um, most prominently in the Gulf area around the New Orleans, Louisiana, New Orleans, and around Alaska. And so here's an example of thinning ice in a village in Alaska. And they've seen an average of 23 feet of shoreline being lost per year because of storms, it's quite a bit. A few of the village's 60 or so buildings have already been abandoned given their proximity to the edge of the town's eroding shoreline. And it's not just this village, 86% of Alaska native village are threatened by thawing permafrost, erosion and flooding, and 31 villages face imminent threats. And at least 12 have already decided to relocate or explore relocation options. So this is not just a future problem, this is a problem for many communities right now. Um, and so there's another tribe in the um, Louisiana area, um, the Biloxi uh, Chinamaka Chocta tribe in Louisiana has lost 98% of its land on the Ile de Jean since the 1950s. And hurricanes, so not only sea level rise, but you couple that with severe storms like hurricanes, um, and they have destroyed 
properties and cause families to leave. So these are, again, issues happening now um, to some tribes and tribes really are on the front line um, of the, some of these impacts. And we have a comment here from Karen mentioning that we've also heard about sea level rise contributing to saltwater intrusion into coastal drinking water wells, potentially causing issues. Also okay. melting permafrost, really disrupting drinking water infrastructure in Alaska native villages. Thank yeah, you. anything that affects the, the drinking water supply is a, an extreme concern. Thank you. Um, okay, are there others that may have any experiences? We'd love to hear anybody's experience with melting ice and sea level rise. Um, if anybody's here, say, from the Gulf area or Alaska, that would be great. But there are other communities dealing with, dealing with sea level rise as well. Saltwater inundation, potentially coastal tribes in Pacific Northwest, um, I, I know, are being impacted as well. So give us your thoughts. And while you do, um, I just want to encourage you to pull up that workshop companion form. Um, we have sent it over email. It should be here if you look on the right box um, under handouts. There's a handout there. Um, that's your workshop companion form. If you open it up, you could um, please look at section two. And basically, it's going to help you track some of your thoughts on all of these health impacts that we've talked about over the last three sections uh, or three sessions of these webinars so that you can um, have a record uh, of what you think is the most critical and significant relevant for your community. And that'll help you as we move into vulnerability assessments and adaptation plans because um, all of what we just learned is really applicable. Now we're going to try to apply it. So you don't so have to I do it right now. Go ahead. I, I hope you've all been uh, filling out your workshop companion form as we've completed each webinar is it's meant for you to be able to fill it in and, and take notes and apply what we're talking about to your own work. Um, and as Angie said, you know, today was the, the final uh, exposure that we were going to be talking about in terms of the, the overarching topics. And the rest of our webinars are going to be about how do we identify and adapt to these particular impacts on our communities. So we're going to really be getting into the meat of things and how this applies to your work in the months to come. Um, I'd actually like to do a quick poll here because uh, I want to check in with you and see how how you're feeling. So now that we've gone through all of these exposures and the health impacts associated with it, I kind of just uh, I'm asking a question here. How do you feel after learning about all of this? Um, and so if you could go ahead and respond. One option is I'm scared and overwhelmed, and that would not be an unreasonable response. I feel, another option is I feel less confused, but more concerned. And another option is I'm happy to have this knowledge so we can take action. And so maybe none of those is exactly right, but pick the one that's most closely related to how you're feeling after learning all of this over the last um, now five webinars. So while you're filling out the poll, we have a comment from Erin Berry. And she says, one of the issues facing the village of Point Hope, Alaska, is loss of shorefast ice. Shorefast ice is basically ice that attaches itself to land in winter and acts both as armor to wave action, helping prevent erosion. Uh, warmer, longer summers are causing that ice to form later and melt sooner, increasing erosion rates. This ice is also used for the annual whale harvests, and its instability presents a risk to the cultural practice as well as the safety of village residents. Wow, uh, I, I've heard about that too from uh, from some folks that I've met at, at meetings and conferences who work and live in Alaska and talking about how the that ice that basically extends your territory in a sense during those winter months is either not forming or like your comment says, Aaron is forming in uh, later in the season and is not as as dense and so it really changes the way people are able to travel and move and and use their own resources so thank you for sharing so i'm gonna close thank you i'm gonna close that um poll and just pull up one thing really quickly i wanted to show you you know for those of you concerned about sea level rise noaa does have some very good 
um, tools. So there are viewing tools that are providing the, per the data and the projections about sea level rise. And so here's one that's illustrating sea level trends and the arrows are representing directional direction and magnitude of change. So if you're- So I think at the moment, they're just seeing our faces. I'm not seeing the, the chart. Oh, okay. How about this? Um, well, I will send you a couple of links to some pretty good tools for sea level rise. Um, for those of you that want to see, if you're coastal or in Alaska and you want to see how it's gonna, uh, how the projections are are gonna affect you, let's share this. Um, let's share the results of the poll. There we go. Uh, okay, so 25 of you say I feel less confused but more concerned, and 75% say I'm happy to have this knowledge so we can take action. And none of you feel scared and overwhelmed. I'm so happy. You guys are very resilient. Um, so that's good, and that's, these are the, I hope, a good attitude to take with us when we start talking about adaptation planning. Well, and I, I want to point out, too, that just like the last one, you could only choose one. You guys, if I was able to take the poll and I could pick all three, because <laughs> I am scared. I'm still scared, and I still feel overwhelmed, but I'm less confused than I was, and I am happy to have this knowledge. I think that all of the above can apply, but I'm glad that none of you chose I'm scared and overwhelmed as your first option. So we're going to keep working on this together and we will make a difference. All right, so we're going to wrap it up for today. I want to really thank you for your participation in our training community and for your comments. Very insightful. It helps us learn as well. Um, we would like to suggest a reading before the next webinar. So between now and October 15th, we're suggesting that you take a look at the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute's Tribal Climate Change Guidebook. It was just released last year. And specifically, I'm asking you to take a look at pages, it's short, 36 to 38, where they're specifically giving some suggestions and case studies about tribal community engagement. And that'll be a topic we talk about in the next couple of webinars. So the next one is October 15th, same time, and you should have it on your calendar. We're gonna talk about vulnerability assessments. It'll be part one of a two-part um, webinar on that topic. Are there any final questions or comments for the day? Anything else come through, Shasta? Anything? Oh, wait, one more. Uh, say the reading. Uh, Aaron wants to know the reading one more time because uh, the slide is not showing uh, at the moment, but the slide will be, we'll send out the PowerPoint and I will send you uh, a link to the reading by email. So that way everybody will have it. Sorry about that all. Okay, yes, we will send that out. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Okay, thanks everybody, we'll see you next time. Thank you.